Hello and welcome back to my Let's Code series. Last time it was pretty well received. We coded um, Minescraper, no, Minesweeper <laughs> in Rust and Wasm and it was pretty well received. So here's the second part where we'll code Snake together today. The classic game Snake. Um, as usual for those who don't know, someone implemented this online and as you can see we are in control of that moving yeah let's call it snake but it's really just a moving i don't know line it's not really a line it's like a wiggly line you can control it change its direction and the goal is to eat up those white bits these should represent the food that the snake eats. Each time you get the food, you become a little bit longer. The snake, I mean. And um, actually, there's no winning condition here, <laughs> I guess. You just keep doing that until you lose. And the losing condition is either you charge into a wall, then you're dead. Or what could also happen is you charge into yourself, then you're also dead. Yeah, that's it. I think that's even more simple than Minesweeper, to be honest. Um, the user, the only user interaction is changing the direction of your snake, and that's it. In this game, we also have a like a um, game timer, unlike Minesweeper, where the game is like stationary and it only proceeds when a user input is found or when you make a decision yourself. This game is different. Um, it will change based on an internal timer. And even if you don't do anything, the timer is ongoing. And um, if you don't actually don't do anything, you will lose because the snake will charge into a wall and you will lose. All right. We will write this also in Rust and Wasm. So let's go by creating a new project. And we'll start by defining our model. Let's get started. Pubstruct snake, or let's call it snake game. This is a struct that will hold all of the game state inside. So what do we actually need for the, for the game? Just like Minesweeper, we are operating on a finite two dimensional rectangle. So let's have a width and a height. But then we also have our snake. Let's make a quick diagram of what the game looks like, right? We have our two dimensional field and uh, we also have a snake and a snake is nothing but a set of coordinates, a set of points inside this two dimensional grid. And for the snake, we have a, we have a direction. So the game would know where the snake will move next and the user can also change it. So the snake is not only a set of points, but also which direction is the snake moving? And also we have a, we have a head of the snake and we also have a tail. So a snake is much more than just a set of points. Okay, let's just encode this information. We have our snake, which is a set of points. And uh, as with Minesweeper, let us, let us extract this, define a new type alias. Um, pop type um, position. And we have a direction. And yeah, let's define an enum for all the four directions we can use. We have top, right, bottom, left. 
So our direction would be a direction. So the direction encodes the, where, the, where the snake is going next. Okay, and as I said, we have a head and a tail. We, we could also, in our struct, have a, another field for the head and another field pointing to the tail of the snake. Let's say I have a head right here, which is of type position. What happens if head points to a position that is not inside the hash set of snake? Then we would have an illegal state and and we generally do not want to have illegal, like, like a type definition that can lead to illegal states because this will just increase our, <laughs> increase our likelihood for bug where somehow the game logic will lead to such an illegal state. And um, we want to avoid that if possible. So one thing we can do is we don't use a hash set. We use a vector. And then we can just say head would be a the index of which position we mean inside this vector. But since a vector is ordered already, we don't even need to have an extra field because we can just say by convention, the, the first item in the snake should be the head and the last item in this vector should be the tail. So... Let's write a comment so the developers who will have to maintain this know afterwards what we intended here. So head is uh, um, the first item, tail is the last item inside this vector. Um, let's put it here so it's more clear what we mean. I think that is actually it for this date. Well, not quite. We we still have our food item, which the snake, we should direct the snake, the user, the player has to direct the snake to the food item. Let's also encode this. Food is also a position. There's always one food item in the game. So whenever the snake eats up the one and only food item, another food item should pop up randomly on the board. Okay, we don't need that import anymore. As I said, we want to design our state so that illegal states are impossible to construct. Unfortunately, it's still not the case with this representation because, yes, yeah, since snake is just a list of positions, we could do something illegal like have a snake that looks like this, like a decapitated snake or something where the points are not connected but there's a there's a gap between um head and the rest of the body for example or stuff like that um so that's we we still need to be careful not to construct those illegal states otherwise it might end up badly for us we we should be mindful let's create Just like Minesweeper, we want to code the uh, game logic first without any regard to wasm and whatnot. So let's create the constructor function. We would want to know the size of the board. The direction, that's interesting. We could hard code direction. Let's say it should always be going to the left. And we would place the snake on the right side of the board, something like that. Mm, we could consider, for example, mm, width minus two. And height divided by two, something like that. The food would be on the left of the board. So let's define this as two and in the middle. Okay, here I can already see a lot of problems <laughs> already. So what if width is one? Then one minus two would be minus one, which is, which is not good because it would 
first of all, not a inside integer anymore. Um, and second of all, um, it would be outside of the board. <laughs> so we want to actually make sure what we do here is all correct. Let's make it the max of width minus one, uh, minus two and zero. And this should be the max. Um, actually, this should be the, wait, um, what happens if I do an integer division and it doesn't return as an integer? I thought they would then round up or round down. I'm not sure. Let me check that real quick. There's a playground on the official Rust website we can play around with. So let's print what happens if I divide. I think it should be one, right? Zero. Okay, we'll round down then. This isn't much of a problem, I think, if you round down. If height is one, it would be zero. If height is zero, it would be zero. If height is two, it would be one. So I think that's okay. Okay, and here we want the minimum number of two and width minus one. Because we don't want to be out of bounds as well. Okay, that should be fine. Let's just test this out by writing a test. Um, test, fn test. Debug print, snake game new, 10, 10. Oh yeah, it doesn't implement debug. Let's derive debug. Okay. Direction also has to derive debug. All right. So snake would be eight five, left foot would be two five. Perfect. Okay. Next we'll do the user interaction. And the user interaction is relatively simple. It's just change direction, right? So let's code this change direction and we can have an input would be a direction. Um, of course, we will have to mutate self for that. We will match. So, so the thing about direction is you can, the, the player can only have three directions to choose from. Like if the snake is already going left, then the user can choose left, top or bottom. The user cannot choose right because the snake cannot make a 180 turn. <laughs> This wouldn't be, this wouldn't be possible. Yeah, so we need to take that into account. If if we want to change direction in a, into an impossible direction, then we should just do nothing. Like in this example, if if the player wants it to go right, it can't. Um. So for this, let's let's match on what direction we have now and the direction we wanna go or the player wants to go. And there are a lot of choices. <laughs> Rust Analyzer has filled up all the possibilities um, in the product space, direction and direction. Oh, cannot move, off self, move out of self-direction, which is behind a mutable reference. That is fine. We can just take the reference instead. So we can already ignore if if the direction is already the direction we want to go, we could just ignore that, right? So let me remove all of that. Um, right, right. Um, bottom, bottom and left, left. And also we can remove uh, um, opposite directions. Top, bottom, that is not possible. Right, left is not possible. Bottom, top is not possible. And um, left, right is not possible. And the rest are interesting choices.
So now we have the problem that this match is not non-exhaustive. So we need to say what happens in the other cases. In the other cases, we will just do nothing, literally. You know what? It would be easier to write it the opposite way <laughs> because right now we would have to basically copy and paste what we want to do, namely self direction equals direction right. We, we, we need to copy paste this to all of the conditions and um, um, adjust the direction. This is, I think, a more elegant way would be to make it the opposite. So we would delete everything that is possible and leave everything that is not possible here. What should be ignored is top top. So we'll leave that. This we don't want to ignore. Right top, right, right, right top. We don't want to ignore. Right, 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 left. We want to ignore. Okay, bottom top. We want to ignore. Button bottom as well. Um, left, right, we want to ignore. Left, left, we also want to ignore. Okay, let's do that. And we can basically make a um, match all of that. And in all those cases, we will actually do nothing. And for all the other cases, we don't care about the direction of the snake as it is right now, but we only care about the new direction. And in all of the other cases, we will just set the direction field to direction. All right. I'm sure this can be made more elegantly, but I think I'm pretty satisfied with that. Of course, this is, this is the easy part, let's say the, the more difficult part is figuring out how to make the snake move in another function which will advance the game timer, right? Let's call it tick. So whenever, so the idea is that we will have a um, timer which will call tick periodically, like, I don't know, h half a second. Does that sound right? And each time we call tick, we will make the snake move and advance our game states, so, so to say. We will make the snake move and also let the snake eat stuff if it is in the correct position. And we will also make the snake longer and so on and so on. So let's figure out how to make the snake move. Okay, let's uh, get rid of the extra stuff. So we have our head here. So let's assume the snake is going this direction. So what needs to be happening is we have to add a position, the position to the left of the head to the snake. And we also want to remove the last, the last item, the tail, right? And the tail would be then the penultimate item on the list. Um, and the head would then move here. Something like that. <laughs> okay, that is very um, confusing now. Okay. To summarize, basically, we want to remove the tail. That's the first step. And then we want to add a new head. In the right direction, of course. And yeah, and this is nothing else than a queue, right? We will add items in on, on, on one end and remove items from the other end. This is nothing else than a queue. So Actually, a, a list, a vector is not the right choice here. We want a queue. There's a queue implementation in the standard library. It's called vec D deck. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's, that's how I pronounce this. But uh, this is basically a double ended queue where you can um, append items on both ends and take out items also from both ends. So 
it's even better than a queue, I guess. So with that, we would have to change this as well. We can do into iter and collect into a double-ended queue. All right. So let's implement move snake. We want to remove the tail first, and we can do so by um, calling pop back, which will remove the last item. Pop back. This will give us an option, but we don't really need to do anything with it, so that's fine. And we want to um, push front the new head. Um, so we need we need to construct the the new item. Let's just say new head equals, and it depends on what direction we are going. So let's match direction um, or reference of that, and we want to get the head as well. Self snake. <laughs> I'm I'm making something a little bit unsafe. Oh well, it's got nothing to do with memory safety, but. This can panic, right? If snake is empty, then getting the first item like this will panic. And that's why we need to make sure that snake is never empty. This is one of the things we need to make sure. I mean, if snake is empty, it doesn't make any sense to play the game anymore. So I think we can assume that. But we could also say if snake is empty, then we just won't do anything and make it safe. Um, so we can just, that's fine. We get a get an option of a reference of, uh, of our position. Now a new head would depend on the head being non-empty. So let's map head. So now new head is now an option. And we will only push it if new head is something. So if let's sum new head equals new head, we will push it into the snake. And actually we want to move the snake only if there is something, right? Hmm, wait. If snake is only of length one, then the new head is also the tail. And then we will remove the tail. And new head would be head would be the tail, and then um I think this works, right? If if, if snake is only if there's only one item in snake, then head is the one item which is also the tail. New head would be um, next to that, and then new head would be sum, and then we pop the tail, which is also the head, and push the new head. Yeah, I think that works. Okay, let's decompose head into x and y coordinates already. Now x is a reference. Let's get it out of the reference, because this is a copy type, so it's no problem. Mm, top would be then x, y minus 1. Right would be x, y, uh, sorry, x plus 1, y. Bottom is x, y plus 1. And left is x minus 1, y. And we need to be careful. If the new head is now outside of the board, then we've lost, right? Okay, so let's also add a lost flag here, so we can uh, we know when the player has lost. Um, let's add it as a guard. If if we've already lost, then there's no reason to advance the timer. Just return the constructor. Yeah, we're missing lost. Um, let's add a helper function. 
Um, let's call it is valid, and we will take an immutable reference to self and the position we want to query. And the condition is when x is smaller than our width and y is smaller than the height. And since these are unsigned integers, they will always be greater or equal than zero. So that's fine. So if self is valid, if it is not valid, new head. Okay, um, wait. A new head is an option. So let's move this into this if statement. We will say the player has lost. Else we will move the snake. Okay, so that's one losing condition. But as I said, the other losing condition is when you maneuver the snake into its own body, then this is also considered a loss. So not only do we need to look for if it is valid, we also need to see if the snake also has, um, already has this position, new position in its body. So if self snake dot contains new head already, then the player also has lost. Mm -hmm. Okay, instead of like having new head here as an option and everything is an option here, let me um let me um query the length of snake as well if length is zero then we don't want to even continue because it's an illegal state and then we can simply get it like this this can never panic and we don't need to map the option anymore, which make the, makes the game logic a little bit more clearer. Head would be then x, y. And new head is now not an option anymore. Okay. The logic of removing the tail and then add the new head applies only to, you know, when when the snake is not eating anything. So if the snake is eating something, then we actually want to make the snake longer. And by making the snake longer, what I mean by that is not to remove head. We should only remove head if not eating anything, right? If the snake eats something, by preserving the tail, we will make the snake longer. And that's what we want to do. So, so we will only remove the tail if new head equals self dot food. Uh, is not, sorry. Is, if the new head is not food, then we will do that. Um, pop the tail. And if it is the food, we won't pop the tail, but we will have to generate a new food position. So something, something. We, uh, we, we need to think about something here. Okay, and this involves <laughs> a random generator again. And I hate to do random stuff in Wasm because it just doesn't work with rand. We, we would have to import the JavaScript random generator. Let me do that again. I mean, we already did that in Minesweeper, in the Minesweeper project. But yeah, j just for completionist sake, um, let's write that again, mod random. We will have wasm bind gen, I think. I, I always need to look up the syntax. I, I don't, I'm never sure. It's like this extern C and we will have uh, fn random, which gives back a double 
and we want to was and bind gen this. JS namespace would be uh, math. Yeah, let's copy this. Okay, import, oops, import that and we will input everything in the prelude. And we will write a new function called random range and we have a min, use size, max use size, and we want to have a use size, which we'll do by calling random times max minus min and then adding min to it. Um, now random is a double, so we need to convert this to a double as well. And then um, floor it and convert back to use size. Okay. Now we can use random range. zero and self dot width and for the y coordinates we will randomly generate zero f from zero to self dot height now that's a random position and there's our next problem <laughs> because if we randomly generate the position there's a chance that the new position might be included in the snake body which will then lead to an illegal state and that is not good. So um, yeah, we need to <laughs> do something about that. We, we need to loop. So uh, we will assign a random position to self.food and we need to see if the snake contains self.food and if yes we need to randomly generate something again but if no we can break it so this loop will randomly generate a, a new position for food until self food is not in the body anymore okay this opens up a lot of other issues like for example what if in what scenarios could this loop be an infinite loop? Like if the breaking condition never holds, then we will have an infinite loop. And that's the case if, for example, the whole board is basically occupied by the snake and we can't even find a new position that is not in the snake, then this will be an infinite loop. <laughs> yeah, so, so we definitely have to take that into account. But I am lazy i'm feeling lazy today so i don't want to care about this and this is such an edge case it will never happen right but this is only a let's code so uh i don't really want to do this so um but yeah it's it's a good style to make sure that this will never happen you know um oh um fine <laughs> you're right of course you're right um Let's limit this to, I don't know, to 100 iterations and then we will panic, okay? That should be enough. Here we go, 100 iterations. And if 100 iterations doesn't work, then the player has won, I guess, right? Then the snake is already full. <laughs> It's it's not mathematically correct. One hundred iterations. We could have one hundred iterations that uh, all, all, all the random generated positions will fall into the snake's body, right? But it's statistically so unlikely that this will happen. So, okay, fine, fine. Uh, let's create a list of all the vertices we can use for the food item. So, okay. Um, free, let's call it free positions, so, like positions that are not occupied by the snake. So we will iterate over all the vertices on the board, all the positions. So let's, let's do that. So we will it first iterate through all the rows. So self.height and we will flat map and then we will 
iterate over all the columns self width map it and we will create x and y tuples and then we want to only filter out those tuples that are not occupied okay self snake contains pause so does not contain pause now we will move y into that okay all right and then we will collect into a vector okay let's forgo this um and we will simply get a new food item from this vector instead so three positions get random range zero and three positions dot length um this will never this can never panic so unless free position is empty which we will also have to take care of so if free position is empty um empty is empty then we will i don't know not do anything right uh, um we will set loss to true <laughs> Well, technically the player has won then. Okay, let's rename loss to, I don't know, game over. Does game over imply that you have lost? I think so. Okay, then let's name it finished. F finished. Okay. Otherwise, uh, finished and we will return because there's nothing to do. We have already finished. And then we will set self food equals free position. And this will never panic because it is in range. All right. Oh, are we happy with that? Um, I think we're happy with that, right? Okay, I think that we already have all our logic in place. This is all we need for a snake game. That wasn't too difficult, I guess. Yeah, what, one drawback of this technique is that we will allocate more memory because we need to uh, well also it has a performance overhead because we are looping over all the free vertices uh, free positions um this comes at a cost and we will also allocate more memory because we will we, we need to collect it into a vector but this is now completely correct right Okay, for this project, um, I was thinking we'll make something new. Like in our Minesweeper project, we've written tons of JavaScript code to make the presentation. So this time I was thinking that maybe we can do it without any JavaScript whatsoever. Okay, okay, that is impossible actually. <laughs> that is uh, that is actually impossible because we need to also load the wasm and stuff like that. We can only do that with JavaScript. So let's write as little JavaScript code as possible, okay? Um, by stating that, we will begin by writing an HTML. Um, let's call it snake. We don't have a star sheet. We don't have a main script. All right. Just like in a Minesweeper project, let's define a root container. And also a script tag that is a module which will contain our loading mechanism. Yeah, and just like in the other project, we will import init and other stuff from... Oh, actually, we, we, we don't want to import other stuff now. Um, from, from our wasm pack build, which we should do right now. Let's Let's build with wasm pack oh yeah we need to define the crate type like this all right sneak js So we will input in it from package snake.js 
And yeah, we need to load the wasm. So we have to write some code, some JavaScript code, async function main, and then we will await on init and we will call main. Okay, I hope that's all the code I need to write in JavaScript today. Let's see if I can meet this constraint. Let me move all this code into a separate file. Snake RS mod snake and use snake snake game. Um, move the test also in here. Well, this is not really a test. Okay. Now there's a, there's a technique to define a main function in wasm bind gen. It's called wasm bind gen start. Um, let's see if this works. Now let's call it main. And yeah, we want to create a new snake game. Yeah, let game equals snake game dot new and let's say I don't know twenty by twenty. Oh yeah, we need to import wasm bind gen. Mm, let's make it mutable because we need it mutable. Mm, and first of all, we're gonna set up the timer. Set up the timer to call tick. Right? We want to call game dot tick in an interval. There's the JavaScript fun function set interval. The set interval method repeatedly calls a function or executes a code snippet with a fixed time delay between each call. That's exactly what we want for calling the tick. And we need to call this from wasm. And for that purpose, our rusted web assembly working group are providing us with um, bindings to all the web APIs and it is called, it is all in a crate called WebSys, so we can just reuse that. Let me get this as a dependency, right? And then we can search for set interval. Um, I guess set interval with callback. We need this feature window. So we need to somehow get a window, get this window struct and then call set interval with callback and then we can pass in a function call. I actually we need with callback and timeout, right? We need to define the timeout um, without arguments. So there's this one. This doesn't have any arguments. Let me just keep this in mind. So we now, we now need to find out how to get a window struct. I think we should, we have to start a document level. Um, well, actually there's a function for the window object, okay? So we call window and then we get a window struct and then we get set interval, we call set interval with callback and timeout and argument zero, okay. <laughs> um, all right, Let, let's do it. So window, um, we will have to unwrap this. Uh, unwrap, unwrap throw is basically the same as unwrap, but if the option is none, instead of panicking, it will throw in JavaScript exception and we can see it in the browser. So uh, anyway, window is always available, so we don't really have to worry about that. So set interval with callback and timeout, timeout and argument zero. So we, we need a reference to a function, a JavaScript function. So no idea about that right now. So timeout would be, what did we say? Half a second. Okay, 500 then, half a second. Um, this will give us a result, but we can just unwrap throw it again. Okay, 
So we need to put in game tick somehow inside here and we need a JavaScript function. I know there's the closure struct in wasm bind gen where we can create JavaScript functions. So we do it by closure, wrap, a new box, and then our Rust closure, something like that. Okay, let's try that. Let's call this closure or tick closure. Wrap box new. And what we're doing is calling game.tick as box um, then fn mut. So now this is a problem. Game does not live long enough. So the problem is this closure needs access to the game variable, which it does by accessing it via a reference. But closures can only accept static Rust closures, which means the closure has to own everything. So one way we can do that is by moving game into the closure, then the closure will own game now, and then it can do dot tick. But then this will fail because we have moved game into the closure. So calling game dot tick afterwards is not possible anymore. So that's bad. Yeah, if I, if I comment this out, then the Rust compiler will complain. Game is, has already been moved out, so we can't really access it anymore. Um, one way we can circumvent this is to have an RC, a reference counter of snake game. Oops. Then we can clone game and have a have a clone of our snake game. Move the clone inside the closure. So what we do um, is then we will clone game first. Let game equals game dot clone, and then move the clone into um, into the closure. Or oh, we need to make it mutable as well. Oh no! Wait. Right, right, right. Now that's that's the next problem. Um, the the reference counter does not allow us to modify everything inside it because of the Rust's borrow rules. Right, you know, we can only have one mutable borrow um, at any point of a struct, and RC is designed that way that we have multiple clones that point to the same object. Right, so it can never allow us to borrow the things inside it. So what we typically have to do is to have some sort of interior mutability again. So let's wrap this around a ref cell. Next. <laughs> Jeez. Okay. Now we can, and we would need to call borrow mut to get a mutable reference to the inner object. And the same here. Game, yes, game is now completely immutable. Okay, wow, that was something. And then we will pass in the tick closure in here as ref. Now it as ref returns us a reference of the underlying JS value, but we want to have a function. So we need to cast it into the function first. And here you can see function is of the JS sys library, which we will also have to import. And JS sys is basically a sister project to WebSys. Um, it also has bindings to all the JavaScript data types. So that fits. Now sref returns us a js value reference and we can call din ref and we want to cast it as a function reference and this will for sure succeed because it is a function. 
on JavaScript side. Let's try, okay, we can remove this then. Let's try it out. I can already tell that this won't work, <laughs> but let us try anyway. So let's serve, start our static file server. All right, we don't see anything on the screen, sure. Um, but there's also no error message, which I find weird. Um, oh yeah, I, I, I forgot to compile, didn't I? I think so, but okay, let's, let's write in, um, a, a console message. Um, here we go. Um, that's writing something like starting, casting it into JS value. Um, compile now. Okay, wait, what? Didn't expect that. What is happening? Oh God, thank God it worked. Holy crap, I just spent um, like too much time really investigating what the heck the problem was. And it seems like it was related to JSS and WebSys and also to my folder name. I've renamed my folder because the previous folder name had like an apostrophe and spaces inside it. And I removed the, uh, well, quote unquote special characters and now it's working. Oh my God. Okay. <laughs> that took too much time, way too much time to figure out, but I am glad it kind of worked. So, um, where were we? Um, we just compiled. Let's see if we can serve this. Holy crap, man. That took way too much time. Here we go. Starting right. And so we can see there's a console being locked. And also it says closure invoked recursively or destroyed already. Yeah. If you've paid attention to the code, you can see we will create a closure here. But according to Rust's borrowing and owning rules, this variable will only stay when until the end of this function, right? Whenever this function returns, the tick closure will be dropped, right? And then in JavaScript, whenever we dropped a closure from Rust in JavaScript, the JavaScript also cannot have access to it anymore. Um, so that's a problem. We need to actually persist this closure like forever. And for that, we may want to make it a static variable. So let's do that. So let's call this tick closure. Um, and this is a closure of din fn mut. And we also need to make the, make the game a static variable, just like in main sweeper, because we want to have global access to it. Yeah, our game struct should also live forever, basically. Let's call this game, and this is a snake game of snake game type. Actually, it's a RC of a ref cell of snake game. And here we need to um, clone game, game, and we need to unpack this, getting the interior value, and we clone the interior value. Okay, that should do it, and we don't need this anymore. And now we can get our tick closure here, do some unpacking. Okay, okay, no. Lifetime may not live long enough. Uh, that's fair. We need to actually then unpack it even earlier here. 
Well, this should work, hopefully. Um, let's call this tick closure for clarity. Okay, now let's see if this works. And by working, I mean it doesn't throw any errors, any runtime errors. Okay, it doesn't throw any runtime errors, so I, I'll count that as a win. Now we want to uh, print something to the screen, right? And previously we've done this uh, with JavaScript, but now let's use WebSys to see if we can actually do the same thing in Rust instead. So let me um, create a new function called render. And what it does, it will print the game state on the screen using emojis again. And for this, we want to first grab our root container, id root. And for that, we need document, access to document. Now let's see if we can find out how to do that in the documentation. Let's search for document. Okay, we can simply get the window and then call document on it to get document, okay. So window dot unwrap dot document. No, um, because I probably need to activate a feature, document feature. Um, we already activated window, so that's good. Here we go, document, and wrap this as well. And then get element, oh, wait, there's no such thing. Let's see, there should be a get element by ID, like the equivalent to the JavaScript API. Oh, we need to activate element. Oh, geez. <laughs> we need to activate a lot of feature toggles. Get element by ID and we want ID root. Let's unwrap this. That is our root container. And we will empty it by setting inner HTML um, if we can. <laughs> Wait, what is this? Oh, this is an element. We need to uh, um, cast this as uh, as an HTML element, I think. Uh, maybe that's also a feature toggle. Uh, yeah, we need to activate that. Maybe we should make it better. Dependency start web sys. So we can actually write it list of features. Okay, and let's see if we can find HTML element. All right, so now root container is an HTML element and we will unwrap that. And then we can set inner HTML to an empty string, and then we can add our own logic. Now, since we do not need to interact with the single fields on the board, we do not actually need to wrap them into HTML anchors, but um, let's make it a grid anyway, shall we? So mm, root container dot style, HTML element dot style, right. Oh, I need to activate CSS style declaration. Hmm, that's uh, quite a lot of feature toggles right there. But okay, the, the point of the feature toggle is to make compiling faster, so the compiler does not need to compile everything that is in the WebSys library, but this is really annoying. Now we have access to style, and we can set something. Set property, um, display, we will set it to grid and unwrap it. 
set property will return a result. Okay, and we will set grid template to, I think it was rows first and then columns, right? Repeat number and the size. So the number would be the rows and the size would be, let's go with auto. And this would be the columns. And we will fill in the placeholders. with game game dot height and game dot width um, and we will make it into a string slice oh height and width are private so let's make them public. Are we good? No. Oh, it's it's behind an RC ref cell. Okay, let let me then borrow this. Right. Okay. And now let's let's loop over all the rows and columns. Mm, actually, let me set a new variable here. Width equals this. And the same with height. Okay, so now we're looping. First we we'll loop over all the rows. Then we will loop over all the columns. And we will create a new div, I think. Document.createElement. Right, maybe I want to have the document in a variable. Okay, so let field element equals a document dot create element, a div, and wrap throw. And then we will add the field element to the root container. Append child field element. Right, this is an element and append child wants a node and field element derives into node, I hope. And wrap throw. Okay, now we want to print something. So we will do field element dot set in our text. Um, set in our text. Oh wait, that is an element. Okay, we need to actually cast this into a div element. Um, HTML div element. Yes, it is another feature flag. Okay, let's add this. Um, now, HTML div element, right, thank you. Um, and now, yeah, um, we want to unwrap it. All right, and hopefully on a HTML div element, we can set in our text. Yes, set in our text. Something. Okay, what kind of states can a field be? For sure it can be empty, right? It can be empty or part of the snake, or it could be the food item. So let's first find out if it is a food item. I think that's the most easiest one. So position is of course, the current position is x, y. And if pause equals game with game game borrow dot food oh let's let's make food public as well let's make everything public shall we i think we should make everything public dot food okay if it's the food item we will write in some food emoji 
I don't know. What do snakes eat, actually? Uh, pizza? <laughs> Um, how about an apple? That's the ba most basic of fruits. So if it's, if it's, if it's the food, then we will print an apple. And if it's part of the snake, oh, we will borrow, um, snake dot contains pause. Then we will print a snake or like a, like a green square. Do we have a green square? Yes, we do. Okay. And otherwise we will just print in a white square. How about that? Mm, I think we can already test this out. Let's call render at the start. All right. Okay, that uh, looks promising. We have uh, the snake on the right side and the food item on the left side. Let's do the same trick as we did in Minesweeper and make this inline grid. And also we probably want to define some CSS. <laughs> I think it's easier if we just have a style sheet here. So let's make the font bigger. Um, 200% maybe. Okay, wow, that's huge. Um, maybe just do a 1, 150. Oh, we don't even need to compile. But yeah, okay, that's already very good. So now we just need to... Whenever we call tick, we also need to render. Okay, let's do that. So in our tick closure, we want to render as well. So after all, we need to show the current state on the board. Okay, now the snake is moving. Yes. And, and the player will lose when the snake reaches. Oh, yes. The snake ate the apple and another random apple popped up. That's amazing. Okay. Uh, now we need to code the user interactions. We need to add event handlers to the window. Uh, and I'm just thinking how we could do that. I think for the event handlers, we also need static closure so they don't get dropped. Right. Um, let's add the code here first. So window and wrap throw. Add event listener with callback. We want to listen to key down, I think. And the listener is something we need to think about. And unwrap throw. Okay, so for the listener, we will create a new static closure. Um, key down handler or handle key down. It's a closure of the FN mod um, of a key press event, I, th I think, or keyboard event, is it called? Okay, we need to activate this feature flag. So we need to have keyboard event. And we will closure wrap again a box new um, as box then fn mod um, keyboard event and we will have a closure right here and we will need to interact with the game so. Actually, now that game is also static, the game is actually already static. Can we not simply don't clone it? I wonder. Let me just try this. Mm, seems like we can. Okay, let's let's just try it. And we don't need to move game inside it because it is already of static lifetime. 
and we would have to game.borrow moot and then say change direction, some direction. We have to figure that out. And then we don't even need to call render because it won't render anything. It will render at the next tick, right? Um, right. Uh, notation error. Closure is expected to take one argument, but it takes zero arguments. Oh, right. Um, here we go. We need a argument. That's right. Okay, and now that we have this closure, we need to put it in here as a function. Um, we'll have to do this, do some unpacking. Handle key down. And then in here, we will do the same thing we did before. We take the closure. This time the handle key down and we will get a reference to it, um, cast it into a function and wrap it. That's it. So now we need to figure out the direction and for this we would need to match the um, oh, event. Event, you can infer it to be, no you cannot, so event is a keyboard event. And we will match event dot, not quite sure, um, let me check. Uh, there's a very handy website for getting the code from the keyboard event, right? And we will just do that. So event dot coach is what we should use mm, or event dot key, maybe event dot key. We will get a string. Oh, it's a little bit annoying that um, code formatting does not work inside macros. Let's try arrow up. Arrow up. Can we actually do something like that? Direction. Okay, we expected a struct string found a string slice. So maybe let's turn this into a string slice. Um, I said let's turn it into a string slice. <laughs> um, okay, that works. So, so of course it's non-exhaustive. So there's this, there's a, a arrow right. Um, arrow bottom. Arrow left. Okay, it's non-exhaustive. I have no idea what to do with that. If <laughs> we should best do nothing, right? Hmm. Okay, you know what? Let me um, do this. In another variable, let um, direction equals and let's put this inside that and we need to format that manually. Change direction, direction and we will return instead of a direction, we will return an option of a direction. So we can uh, we can handle something when it's some and do nothing when it's none. Okay, this seems to be working. Um, also, top direction top is a little bit misleading. So let's rename this to up and. Um, Actually, this is down, right? Arrow down. Let's rename this to down. So that's it, actually. Let me let us try it, test it. 
um, we have to, of course, <laughs> we have to um, compile it first. All right, and we can change the direction now. Well, wow, half a second is really, really slow. Let me see if we can play with this already. This is, this is fun. <laughs> I think the grid is a little bit too much, too big. Okay, let's see if we can lose by crashing into a wall. Yes, after crashing. Oh! Wait, it shouldn't... After crashing, it should not accept any input anymore. Okay, let's fix this. So, if self-finished, we should not do anything. Yes, if self-finished, return. Okay, let's make the board a little bit smaller. Let's say 1515. And we can make the font size bigger. All right, and make it faster because that is a little bit boring, to be honest. We have our set interval here. Let's, I don't know, 200? 200 maybe a little bit too fast. Okay, wow, that is fast. Holy moly, okay. Let's try to lose. By crashing into a wall. And now we can't do anything anymore. So that worked. And let's try losing by crashing into ourselves. Yes, it also does not respond anymore. All right. Oh, wait, what happened? How did I crash into myself? <laughs> wait. Wait, how can I fail here? I don't, I don't get it. Oh, wait. Okay, there's a bug here. Somehow we can lose even though it's not possible to lose here in this situation. And I think it's because of this logic here. Um, change direction. Because we are filtering out the invalid stuff. Yeah, this, I don't know how to explain it, to be honest. Um, if we change direction, it will happen instantly, right? We we'll just set the field of the direction. But Tick is working in a game time. So, um, so what happens is, let's say during one tick, the snake is going left. And during one tick, I press the down button. And then our logic of checking if this is an invalid direction will kick in. And it is not because the snake is going left first and now we're going down. But in the same tick, we will press the right arrow. And and this is also a valid position because right now um, the, the down direction is its direction, right? The opposite direction would be to the top and that is not allowed. But if I press the right button, it is allowed. This is causing the loose state. And actually we should prevent this. So maybe a good idea is to not set the direction directly, but to cue the next direction we want to go to. So in order to do that, let's add a new field called next direction. It can be private. Next direction would be equal to direction at first, but then if I call change direction, um, I still need to check direction and, and compare it to the new direction. But if it is a valid combination, we will not set direction directly, but set next direction. And at the tick, when, when the tick comes, when the game timer moves forward, we will set the actual direction to the next direction. I think that will fix it. Cannot move out. Why would you need to move out? It's, oh, because it's not a copy type. Okay, let's um, derive clone and copy on this one. It's fine because this is basically a U8. 
or actually even less than a U8. Okay, I think this should work. Okay, let's change rapidly the direction during one tick. Yeah, we don't run into the problem anymore. Okay, um, to make it more accessible, let's denote the head of the snake when we render this. So else if game with game um, game dot snake oops dot borrow dot snake dot get zero equals sum of pause. Then it's the head of the snake and we want to print something special. Let's see if we can find something special. Do something like this, I guess. All right. Now the player will know where the head is. Uh, and maybe I can... I feel like the, the white boxes are a little bit too much. Mm, let's add a class to the field element. Um, class name, set class name, field. And then we can write some CSS for field. Um, let's have it, let's set the width and height to that. 80% of the font size. Yeah, one rem. And then we can also don't render anything for empty fields. Now maybe add a border around the root container. Border, um, one pixel solid, I don't know, gray so that the user, the player knows where the boundaries are. And to make it symmetrical, let's move the snake, the initial snake to width minus three. Okay, yeah, that looks good. And then center it, text align center. That should do the trick. All right, <laughs> that's beautiful. Okay, now let's activate the uh, interval again. Let's rename this to handle tick. Mm, right. It should be fine, actually, unless the emoji are not, somehow the emoji are not uh, correctly placed. That is kind of weird. Let's try line height. But why is it a little bit off still? Okay, I guess we will need to <laughs> make a little bit of a hack. Um, text indent minus one rem. Is that okay? No, it's not. Let's make it dot two rem. Okay, this should suffice. Okay, no idea <laughs> about that text indent. Let's just do this hack, like a simple hack. Okay, right, we will add a line height and also a text indent. Okay, let me activate the timer again. Okay, now we can play. Well, last but not least, we can make the render function look better. We have in several places, we are unwrapping game in several places with game.with and something something. And here as well, I think we can just refactor it. So if we put this at the very beginning, we should be able to avoid unwrapping that much. Let's move that all inside the closure and then we wouldn't need to have, we wouldn't need this anymore.
Okay, and can I do something like let game equals game dot borrow? Is that possible? Seems like it. Okay, then we can also we also don't need to call borrow anymore. Yay! It's completely working now. Yeah, I think that's it. I think that's a good point to stop coding. <laughs> I learned a lot of things again this time, like how Wasm bind gen has problems when the folder name has spaces or apostrophes in it. That that was fun. And it will also give some very cryptic error messages. Yeah, I, I don't know how I feel about that. But well, I'm glad I figured out what was wrong and we could continue. Because I was like copying copying the project to another location and see if it will compile. Um, and somehow it did, which I did not expect. I expected like same behavior if I moved the project to somewhere else, you know, um, translation invariancy and stuff like that. But no, it was because of my folder name, I think. All right, and I hope you enjoyed this project. Let me know in the comments what you thought of this one and what you would like me to code next. Another vintage classic video game perhaps or something else. This can still be improved of course. Like when you lose you probably want to tell the player that they lost. Right now we just don't say anything. We just stop accepting user input which is really bad UX. And also there's no way to start a new game. We have to reload the page to do that. That could be improved. You could experiment with uh, multiple food items on the screen, make some visual effects. I don't know, animations, of course, you can always do that. Yeah, but I am very happy of how this turned out. Well, that's it, I think. And as always, thank you for watching till the end. And have a nice day. I hope to see you next time. Bye.